Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about LTS and government mandates and open source and kind of the, uh, the, the Venn diagram of these three things coming together. Uh, I've kind of picked a little bit of a sensational headline, but I've done that on purpose because I want to start the presentation out with the words, don't panic. And I'm going to end the presentation with the words, don't panic. <laughs> okay, so we're really going to look at three things for the course of this, this talk, um, but I'm going to concentrate more on kind of the computer science with the emphasis of the word science part of the equation because as software engineers, that's what we together in this room have the most control out of. We don't have control over governments. They're going to do what they're going to do. I mean, we can certainly try to influence them through the best efforts that we can do, but really a lot of the, the key to us collectively together as a community keeping sane is with, on the technical side of uh, the matter of LTS and upping our game in that space. Okay, so let's get into the heart of the matter. Uh, so just to start out with a very defini basic definition of what is long-term support. Very simple idea. You've got a project out there in the world. They are, as a group, working to accomplish a goal. It's maybe cryptography, maybe it's a graphics library, whatever, but the point is, is you have code that's getting merged into a mainline that's cutting edge development, you know, you're adding functionality, things going great, but you have a set of users and you branch off and you support that branch for an extended period of time. And the point of that branch is then you don't expose that user base to features and things that might break, you know, any sort of your, you know, your ABI or, the, you know, functions that you're uh, putting out there, so it's all about stability. That's the point. Uh, the thing is, though, if you do this, and projects kind of have to grow to a certain size in order to be able to make this happen, it is a draw against your resources because now you're sort of supporting two efforts. One of which is, you know, that mainline development, which is running along, going as fast as it can, trying to do good things, innovative things, and then the other side of the equation, which is taking care of people, making sure that you fix bugs, fix security, you know those kinds of issues as they come in. Okay, so if you're gonna have an LTS, you as a community probably wanna have a set of policies that clearly communicate to those people who are consuming your LTS, you know, what it is that you're gonna allow into it. You know, so how long are you gonna maintain it? Is it just for a couple of years? Is it six months? Is it something longer than that? And oftentimes that's a function of the community that is consuming the code. Then you need to have a policy of what actually constitutes a fix and what is going to be allowed. So you can have communities out there, so CIP is a wonderful example, where they allow new functionality in, but they do so within a certain context. It's not necessarily evil, but that can be disruptive because new functionality often implies that it's going to break something that, that people were relying on. Uh, you need to have you know, sort of a decision process of how you are going to pull in code from your main line if that's the process for how fixes get in or through other you know, side doors. Is it an individual who's looking at that and deciding what you know, are fixes? Is it an AI? Uh, is it a script? You know, how is that done? And so people should know. That should be an open process so that people can even give input and say, hey, this fix is important to me. Please get this included. Uh, another thing which is important is your fixes themselves. Are you tracking them? Are you, you know, are they, you know, put out on a public mailing list so that people can say, okay, you know, I saw this thing go by. Are they in Bugzilla? You know, whatever. The point is, is you just have to have a process which is open and communicative that people can see. Uh, and this sort of all contributes into what I like to call project hygiene. So, you know, great projects, you know, to me that are the gold standard is, when you see the commits go by, they're labeled, you know, fixes are labeled. It's pretty clear this is a fix. It's not glommed together with other things which are new functionality. You know, you keep those two things separate. You have a community of people who are, you know, concerned about maintaining code for long periods of time. And then there's a system of validation, you know, through CIs. Are they, you know, do you have regressions, testing? Do you have test suites? All that kind of good stuff to contribute to, again, a good experience for the people consuming LTS. So I want to now go through a couple of examples. So I've been picking on U-Boot whenever I've given talk or uh, talks that are like this as sort of not being a, the great greatest community yet of what they could be. So U-Boot does not have an LTS. They don't, they don't expend effort into that. Uh, they have patches that fly by. Sometimes they're fixes, sometimes they're features. So if you're somebody that's consuming the U-Boot project, you kind of just sort of pick it up at the release 
boundary or maybe the release boundary plus something. And that can be a little frustrating because again, you don't have something that's being supported in the long term. Um, the other part that's very interesting too is U-Boot does share a certain amount of code with the Linux kernel project. So you can have fixes going into the Linux kernel, but that doesn't automatically mean that those fixes that are going to Linux kernel are also going into U-Boot. People have to sort of wake up and go, oh yeah, we need that over here too. Okay, the Linux kernel, I sort of refer to as a goldish standard. I don't think it's the gold standard. I think there's still room for improvement. We're gonna get into that in later slides. But LTS has been around in the Linux kernel community for a long time now. Um, so even, officially it really started as it is today back in 2616, if you can remember back that far. Um, my, my life in the Linux kernel started in 22, but we won't get into that. Um, and the other thing that's really interesting too is, is that, of course, the kernel community through Greg has started being a, you know, a numbering authority when it comes to CVEs. And so we've recently seen a, an interesting change to how CVEs are done within the Linux kernel. Um, it's still a new process. We're still learning things. We've got to kind of sit back and watch how it's all going to go. But you know, point is, is that things are happening. Okay, so with the Linux kernel, at that URL right there, you can see what the, the patch process is for fixes. So it's very clear, you know, it sets a standard, users know what's gonna go in, you know, as a developer, you know what it's gonna take to get your fix to move forward or not go forward because you don't apply to any of the rules. Okay, great. Uh, now, let's think about the journey of a fix. A journey of a fix is actually a very complicated process, especially in the Linux kernel. So we're gonna continue with using the kernel as an example. Uh, what happens for LTS from the community and what happens for vendor kernels, like say a Red Hat or something like that, they are different journeys for those particular bug fixes. And that is a reflection of the patch process that is used by those respective either communities, you know, being a, a distribution like either a Debian or, or an open community or something that's a little bit more commercial like a Red Hat or you know, so on and so forth. And so the point is, you gotta watch out at, you know, as an LTS consumer, how they actually pull up, pull their fixes. So pretty much everybody does some amount of cherry picking, even the Linux stable process in the kernel. So the concept of cherry picking is just saying, okay, I have a fix here, I'm just gonna pick up that fix, get it into my thing that I care about, and pull that back. And that can be good, that can be bad, but the problem is with cherry picking is sometimes you have dependencies, and those dependencies can be less than clear about, okay, this fix here actually depended on a prior fix, which depended on a prior fix, and unless you pull in that full context of fixes, guess what, you're in for some fun, and it's not about that kind of fun. Okay, so I was kind of picking on path strategies earlier. Um, so at least in the kernel community, we all agree that if you're gonna have a fix, that fix has to apply against mainline. That's awesome. That's great. That sets a clear standard. However, there's an anti-awesome here. And that anti-awesome is that if I'm out and I'm using an older kernel, so let's say I'm on 6.1, I find a bug, but the kernel community has moved on. You know, we're living in the land of 6.10 now. And the architecture has changed in some way where the bug fix that I have has no application to 6.10. The community doesn't care. That's, they've moved on. <laughs> but the bad thing is, is I still have a bug. Well, what do I do with that bug? Well, you can, you know, you, you, you've got to go out and start convincing people that, I, you know, this is fix is important. And so in the case of a vendor, like a Red Hat, they're going to pick up that fix because it's obvious fix is a bug that their user base might be using, you know, especially if you fill out the bug report and all the right things are there. However, the kernel community is going to look at you and go, eh, that's old. <laughs> you know, upgrade your kernel which is not necessarily a bad thing to do either. But the point is, is I just wanna say, we, you know, we have a little bit of a hole there as a kernel community when it comes to fixing things. Um, okay, now, one of the things that we've noted, uh, so Dan Carpenter, uh, he's uh, the one that uh, should uh, take the credit for this particular graph, but it, it shows something very interesting, which is over time for the community LTSs, so this is the stuff that Greg and Sasha maintain, is that when they initially get released, you see a whole bunch of fixes that get applied, but over time, the amount of fixes go down. And you know it's kind of obvious why this is the case, and that's again because as a kernel gets older, an LTS kernel in particular, things don't just auto-apply. And those are the easiest fixes to pick up. 
The stuff that doesn't auto apply, you now have to backport, or you have to take a look at the context of the fix and go, okay, does this, is this really meaningful? Eh, or you know, you have to invest some engineering to redo it. And that's no fun. People don't like doing that. Um, the other thing which is really interesting, and so this actually came from a paper that I'm going to talk about in, in the very next slide, but you can look at things in, from the perspective of you have a fix, it went, it went against mainline, how long did it take for that fix to travel from mainline into the LTS kernels? And this is a really cool thing to go and watch for, but nobody's really tracking this which is really interesting. So I think this is one of the ways that we as a kernel community, we probably should up our game a little bit and start doing this. Um, so this is logarith logarithmic as far as the scale is concerned. And in the case of like 44449, dead kernels, they're dead to us. We don't want to see them and we don't want to hear about them. They're old, they're ancient. But for the purposes of data, for the population of fixes that they picked up, you can see, for, they're the lower part of the curve here, that when you get to you know, 10 squared days, you know, about 80% of the patches were in at that point. And during the lifetime of that kernel, there were still patches that were getting picked up. So the point is, is that for newer kernels, like a, you know, 515, which is the newest one on the graph, things have shifted this way, which means you're picking up bug fixes faster. That's a good thing, we wanna see that. But we still see delays, you know. So this is 10 days, you know, that's 100, so on and so forth. And so, you know, there's still a delay between when things land in mainline and when they ultimately go into LTS. But still, if you think about it, this is on the order of months for the most part. That's not bad. Okay, so the paper that I was talking about, um, which is what really kicked off a lot of my own personal thinking, and I'd kind of like to see some more papers in this space. I think this is a good area for, you know, at least some people to take some, um, some thinking, or apply some think thought to, is that, you know, First, not all LTS kernels are maintained the same way. They don't all have the same patch policies. It's probably not a good thing. Um, but they examined a few different factors. So they were looking at patch delay, they were looking at patch rates and bug inheritances. Um, all good stuff, all interesting. Uh, the link's in the, in the slides, go read the paper. <laughs> I'm not gonna go through it in too, too much detail. Um, but it did trigger one thing that I wanna just plant as an idea into your minds, and that is, should we have an LTS next? So we have a concept, of course, in mainline, which is there's that set of patches which are still kind of out there, they're interesting, but they're not ready to get picked up by, by Linus or a, as necessarily a subsame, subsystem maintainer, but they sit out there in, in next. Should we be doing the same thing for LTS? So if you think about this, within a particular release of the Linux kernel, so I picked on 6.9 for, uh, for this slide, you know, you have a bounded set of patches. We know what all those patches are at the point that that kernel is released. And out of those patches, if we apply the rules for what constitutes a fix, as well as, you know, those things that just happen to have fixed tags, which they're supposed to have when a fix is a fix, you can break things down between what's new functionality and what's fixes. So that's pretty easy to do. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, um, since we know that not everything is getting picked up, you could literally just pick all this up right here, say this is LTS next, and just jam it in there and say what, what, what applies to those LTS kernels. For the stuff that doesn't apply, you put it on some list and just say, okay, this needs a backboard. Um, you know, does anybody want to work on that? You know, hello, college students, you know, something along those lines. But you, you, you could definitely start to have more of a formal way of approaching the problem than what we have today of, you know, fixes just flying by and, you know, please backport and it's on CC or Sasha picks it up with auto cell, you know, that kind of stuff. So just, you know, there's, there's something to be thought about here. Um, so anyways, this is, this is kind of my, my, my question that I do pose, which is just, why don't we just roll this into an LTS next tree? And that would, of course, that would be applicable to each one of the, uh, um, the LTSs that are out there. I don't think you do it for all of them. I don't think you do it for the ancient ones. And I think this gets easier over time. Getting it started would be work, <laughs> no doubt about it. But it would definitely make it, e um, make it interesting. Another thing that we don't really do for the kernel is we don't look at defect rates. And so uh, this, this graphic over here is sort of what you, gets used for data-driven, you know, uh, 
data-driven things. And so, you know, it's basically the old World War II aircraft where the ones that get back are the ones that have bullet holes in them. And so you look at the converse of that and just say, or I should say the inverse of that, which is to say for the ones that didn't get back is probably where the bullet holes aren't, <laughs> you know, because they were the ones that you don't have data for. So the point is, is for the Linux kernel, we do have data as far as where the fixes are, because remember that was the fix tags that are supposed to be associated with each and every patch that gets accepted. And you can break that down pretty easily because you know where the fix applies to. So you could go and look at the kernel directory structure and break that down. So like just say for an average release, say that was a thousand fix, fixes that were there, you could break that down and say, okay, well, 500 were against drivers. All right, let's further break that down into the other subdirectory, so on and so forth. And so that kind of tells you where the quality had to improve. Now this is a, you know, this is a, not a leading indicator, it's you know, something that's more showing you history over time, but the point is, is that it might imply to us that care about the kernel where maybe we should be doing a little bit better as far as tests are concerned. And I think that's, that's sort of another thing to take away from this is you know, we've got great things in LTP, we've got great things in some of the other test suites that are there, but there's still room for a lot of improvement you know, when a fix comes into the Linux kernel, we don't have a new test case that goes with that particular fix either. Um, you know, it's not necessarily saying we have to, and it's not saying it's easy, but for areas that have high fix rates, it could imply that we maybe need to do a better job in having test suites. So this kind of gets me to uh, the observations, is that I think in general when it comes to the kernel, and LTS in particular, we probably should be thinking in terms of being a little bit more data driven. We should be monitoring fixes. You know, we should be thinking about their lifetime. We should probably not be dependent on a system of cherry picking per se, where it is up to either an individual or an AI or something along those lines. We should probably just be a little bit more formal, say, okay, this was all the stuff that went into a release. Let's, let's pick it all up, give it a whirl, and uh, just, you know, we, we ask users to take the latest, greatest kernel because that has all the fixes. Well, no, it doesn't have all the fixes. It has all the fixes that we grabbed at that particular time, at that particular date. Uh, okay, so I already talked about you know, fixes, not necessarily having new tests. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but we should probably think in terms of those areas of the kernel that are seeing quality issues that maybe that's the parts of the kernel that we should be putting effort into having new tests. Uh, and you know, again, you know, we talked about the various ways that things can get in. Uh, and then lastly, of course, when it comes to kernel CVEs and the numbering authority process, you know, it's under change. But I think, you know, again, as a community, we should probably have heightened awareness or heightened reason to watch that process for the next year and just see how well is it working for us. And then, you know, probably all get together and have a conversation about, you know, is this working for us? Is this good enough? Um, so that's just a Something I want to, again, plant in your minds. Okay, now we get into kind of the second and third part of the presentation since we're kind of running out of time. Uh, and that is, you know, when it comes to government mandates and laws and all that kind of good stuff, there's getting to be a list. And I'm not going to go through all of them. That's not the point of the presentation. It's, you know, it's going to be really up to others to, you know, create some blog posts and break things down and kind of try to communicate to each and every one of us, you know, what kinds of things are going to be either helpful or a hindrance, and you know, watching all that is going to be very complex. And that also means that you know, if you work for a company, you know, you probably have a legal department, and they're probably going to have to get involved, and it's going to be not fun. <laughs> you know, just sorry. Uh, you know, I, I yeah, lived in those early times when uh, I used to work for IBM, and I, I worked with the IBM legal department for a long time. I was part of the team that was trying to convince them that, yeah, we really should be involved with open source. It's not evil. It's not bad. Um, but that took a long time to get there and to convince them. And I think likewise, we're sort of seeing the same problem with these government mandates and such where, you know, governments are reacting to a problem, which is we have software defects. They're causing problems. They see security issues crop up. You know, users get burned. And then, you know, the governments are sort of trying to almost do the right thing in their minds, which is let's make the lives of consumers better. Well, you know, where that kind of gets dumped on us, unfortunately, isn't just, you know, do better software engineering, but now we got a law that's, you know, holding a stick over our heads where it's like, do it better or else. And that's, uh, that's not great either. But, you know, you can kind of draw a little bit of a trend here. Um, so one of which is devices are going to last longer. So governments are telling us that you need to have 
a software plan that takes into account the lifetime of device, and they're going to tell us how long that device has to last. So in, you know, like in the case of the, um, the ecosystem law that went through, you know, they were basically saying in the case of handsets, you know, five years, that's the minimum that you have to support something after it's off of the market, you know, so it's not even being sold anymore. And then, you know, there's obligations as far as security updates, you know, where they've been talking about four months and, and such. So, you know, point is, is that these laws are going to apply, you know, differently from country to country. There are going to be some variations as far as expectations, even from industry to industry. So for what you have to do for you know, devices that are in the healthcare industry or something that might be for a car, what have you, you know, the bar will be different than as composed to just you know, something that's you know, involving your phone or a watch or something along those lines. But it's a trend. You know, the point is, is we have to maintain our software for longer and our, the software on our devices for longer periods of time. And we have to have the latest, greatest security taken into account. And we have to get updates out into the field. I mean, we're just going to have to do this. That's, um, you know, for the good of the universe. That's where the governments are coming from. So this sort of comes us to the how do we not have a roaring dumpster fire? How do we not panic? How do we stay sane? Um, and again, you know, the words don't panic here apply. So, you know, CRA, eco design, yada, yada, yada. There's a whole list of things which are out there that are getting either drafted or they've been passed. Um, it's complicated, you know, again, if you're with a company, it's, you know, it's going to be an internal discussion. And the biggest thing I, I really want to impart on you is just don't panic. <laughs> you know, there's, there's going to be all sorts of sensationalism out there. The point of this talk is not to add to that sen sensationalism at all, but it is to say that, you know, we as software developers, we got to take care of our own houses, but you know what, we're all brilliant engineers, we can do this. Uh, we really can. So, you know, have, have faith in yourself and, you know, have faith in yourself being an ambassador to those who are not software engineers to explain to them how we're going to mitigate and do the right thing on behalf of users and software development and just the industry in general. Okay, uh, so again, you know, from a software trends perspective, we've got to have updates for software through the lifetime of the device. And, you know, those lifetimes sometimes may be dictated to us but you know, again, you know, the idea is, you know, let's not just create throwaway things. Let's give them security updates and all that kind of good stuff. And then from the purposes of open source software, um, you know, I think the most important thing that we can do together as a community is let's be organized, let's communicate clearly, let's, you know, have, you know, open discussions about bugs, let's make sure that we, you know, do, you know, some amount of triage on those bugs to understand just how important they and impactful they are. And, you know, the trivial stuff, let it be trivial. Let's concentrate on the important stuff. You know, CVEs and CNAs, uh, you know, it's a process. Is that the best process for security? Um, I think the jury's still out on that one. I think that's something that we all have to evaluate. And I, and I really think that we should, you know, as, you know, we're, we're seeing governments latch onto them and say, oh, no, this is the process for sure. Maybe it's not the best way of doing things. Uh, so just, you know, keep that under your hat. Think about it, you know. It's, uh, maybe there's better ways of doing things. But the one thing that we do know is, you know, we need to do more testing. We need more test suites. We need those things to be effective to catch regressions. And, you know, that is a, a hard thing to do. It's not easy and it's not something that people necessarily like to do either. So that's certainly understandable. So, um, you know, as far as LTS is concerned, I think there's still an interesting thing that's going out in the community. And that is, or I should say, even in the world of people who are making products where you sort of have two paths to consider. One of which is upriving. So this is the concept of, you know, you start out with a kernel like 6.6, you ship that 6.6 kernel, and then two years in the field, you do an upgrade to maybe the next LTS kernel. So maybe that's going to be a 6.10 or a 6.15 or whatever the number ends up being. But the point is, is that you build that into your software plan to be able to do that and to upgrade that device in, in the short term. And the great thing about, you know, sort of that, that quick, nimble sort of approach is that guarantees that you're on the latest, greatest. That's a great way of doing things. But the point is, is that there's still the old method methodology too, which is you start on a kernel and you want to, that kernel to live for a longer period of time. Maybe it's four years, maybe it's six years, maybe it's 10. You know, we all understand it's hard to live on an old kernel. It's even hard to maintain them. Is that the best way? Well, this gets back to another heart of the piece of this 
presentation, which is we should be data driven. And there's not a lot of data to say either up revving or extended LTS and give us a guidance based on that data of what is the right thing. I mean, I think as developers, we latch on and say latest, greatest. Absolutely, positively, you should do everything and optimize for that kind of experience. But the point is, we need data to back that up and, and say that, that that really was the best, most efficient pathway for a product or uh, what have you. But regardless of which, which path that you take, testing is going to be key and regression testing and all that. So with that, that is the end of the presentation. I guess I didn't put a thank you slide there. So nonetheless, thanks for being here and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you for that presentation. Um, so maybe I will ask <coughs> two questions, if, if you allow. So the first one is about the uh, LTS kernel. You told us after a while the patches entering the kernel uh, in master, they do not apply to the stable branch anymore, and they got dropped on the floor, basically. Uh, I think I heard about an even longer term uh, effort for automotive, specifically, where they wanted to maintain a 10 years uh, LTS-like kernel. I forgot the name. So maybe it's uh, one solution. I don't know. Yeah, there's, um, so at least out in the community that I know of, and you're right, there might be something for automotive, which is even, you know, 20 years or something along those lines. I know CIP is trying to do 10, but they're doing so with a very narrow context. So they only test on a certain number of boards, um, and even then they're being mm. very selective as far as what fixes that they'll actually pick up. Okay. So they're not trying to be a general purpose kernel. Um, mm. you, know, not, you know, not saying that's a bad thing, it's just, you know, that's the way that they're approaching the problem. Okay. Yeah, and uh, the second one was about your, your comment on LT, um, sorry, not LTS Next, but uh, saying, okay, on the, on the Next, you could consider you have a window of patches in flight, basically 200 branches, and you're saying uh, uh, half of, well, maybe not half of that, a share of that yeah. are actually fixes. But then I was under the impression that maintainers had a um, high priority access to Linux to send uh, pull requests or, or patch queues when it comes to down to important fixes. Right. So uh, I think not all the patches are equal in, in that next. Um, yeah, yeah, that's very true, because you know, you're right that either subset maintainers or even you know, certain luminaries within the kernel community, you know, they can, for whatever reason, get very excited about a certain thing and just say, OK, guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. this has really got to go through. And then that does result in at least like the kernel community's Linux table picking that up fast, too. So I wonder, maybe the, the important fix is, in fact, they make it faster into the master branch, hopefully, yeah. which means maybe in terms of fixes, in fact, uh, there is less value in next. But I'm not sure. I mean, we need data, as you said. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the, and the thing is, is when it comes to any bug, you know, it's only a priority when it affects you, <laughs> you know? Yes. Th those are the worst bugs. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Anybody else? All right, if not, thank you very much, everyone, and 